Afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to come here. It's been a, a wonderful workshop um, so far. So I was asked to talk about science writing and was told that the goal of this conference is to excite, inspire and educate scientists with the hope of increasing overall happiness in the scientific community. This, of course, isn't possible because there's only so much happiness to go around in science. <laughs> Either your referee is happy because they're dismantling your paper, or you're happy because your reputation has survived another day. That, at least, is the premise of defensive scientific writing, and I'll try to educate you on that matter today. I should point out that there's nothing exciting or inspiring about this subject. <laughs> So my interest in science writing began several years ago when I realized that writing could actually deflect attention from the science itself. I'd written a paper, a line in which read something like Stokes' law and something to do with, with a particle of a particular size or girth. And this seemingly innocent remark had a dramatic effect on the review process. The referee became very confused as to what we meant by the word girth. <laughs> This was actually the only question they raised in their report, which ended <laughs> shortly thereafter. Uh, rejection was uh, swift and merciful. And although some might consider this a setback, upon further reflection, I realized that it could have been worse. The article lives out a respectable existence in the lower tiers of the scientific literature, avoiding the kind of scrutiny that comes with being, well, read. So, the alternative is not necessarily better, so I use statistical mechanics, and I'm an advocate of what one of my colleagues presumably um, affectionately refers to as comically simple models. And on those rare occasions where I've succeeded in actually conveying to the reader my intended meaning, it's not always gone well for me. So uh, these are a collection of some of my better uh, reviews. Uh, you don't want to see the bad ones, like these guys will see uh, right through you. So one is tempted, therefore, to conclude that science is a terrifying enterprise filled with skeptical referees, dubious examiners, and hostile editors. Help is at hand, though, in the form of defensive scientific writing. So this is a set of principles designed to protect your science. If the reader's forced to divert energy from understanding the content of your work to deciphering your writing, your reputation may survive unscathed. So admittedly, reading such a piece of writing is the literary equivalent of, reading one of, uh, of watching one of Mourinho's football teams protect a narrow lead for 90 minutes. It's not pretty, but that's the point, isn't it? Nobody wants to watch that kind of thing. Those of you who practice more legitimate forms of scientific inquiry may not need to resort to such measures, but it can't hurt to know about them. Uh, and so before we go into the details, it's worth pointing out those approaches in the literature that are, are best avoided. So Orwell, George Orwell in 1946 wrote an essay, Politics and the English Language. So the, the phrase Orwellian has come to mean an attitude of misinformation, propaganda, or denial of truth. But more disturbingly, Orwell was actually a proponent of clear and precise writing, exactly the kind of writing that offers little protection for your science, best avoided. Almost as bad, an article written in the 1990s by George Gopin and Judith Swan. It's called The Science of Scientific Writing. In it, the authors propose ways of structuring sentences to allow the reader to most easily extract your key ideas. Again, another approach uh, best avoided by the wise reader. So we'll revisit some of these ideas as we delve into the details. So we'll, we'll start by simply observing that one should never use a short word where a long and intimidating one will do. So this rule is elementary. Scientists, especially those of us who know several fields worth of jargon, are best placed to under exploit the principle underlying this rule. If it sounds impressive, it probably is. <laughs> Don't undersell what you did. Your method should become your methodology or better your methodological approach. That these mean different things is a bonus because while the referee is trying to work out if you're referring to a method, a set of methods, or making some funny reference to a strange branch of logic, the details of your approach may evade some scrutiny, useful for the reasons stated previously. So there are other contemporary gems in use that you can avail yourself of. Nowadays, we don't need to build, for instance, nanoparticles when you can architecture them. You don't have to use a theory when it can be leveraged. And a working study should probably be an in operando study. 
Which brings us to Latin words, and these, as noted by Orwell, are in fact grander than their Saxon equivalents. <laughs> so nobody, for instance, is going to ponder the details of your calculation when it's sandwiched by the examples shown there. Orwell also writes about meaningless words, which is a little harsh. Flexible may be a better description for our purposes. So he says, in the case of a word like democracy, not only is there no agreed definition, but the attempt to make one is resisted from all sides. It's almost universally felt that when we call a country democratic, we're praising it. And consequently, the defenders of every kind of regime claim that it's a democracy. We fear that they might have to stop using that word if it were tied down to any one meaning. So in science nowadays, we're fortunate to have ready-made alternatives to drop straight into place. Consider using these. Consider also these examples if you run out of anything to say about your approach. So the best exponents of these principles use words to befuddle a reader the way a plane uses chaff to confuse a missile. So such tactics are, are best uh, incorporated within a larger strategy for protecting your science. And we can infer from the literature that information is more likely to escape undue attention if it's placed where the reader least expects to find it. So to examine that idea, I want to uh, consider a passage from the scientific literature. And I don't mean to imply that this is a particularly a good or bad piece of writing. It simply strikes me as a, a fairly standard piece of scientific text. So it says, these observations taken together with the bright and long-lived photoluminescence, the difficulty of electron tunneling through the inorganic shells and insulating ligands, previous claims by others and consistency between experimental observations and simulations strongly suggest that excitonic energy transfer and not free charge carrier motion is responsible for exciton transport in our samples. So we'll use this to examine the structure of this passage. So this is the, the stress position, what these authors refer to as the stress position. And so they say, it's linguistic commonplace that readers naturally emphasize the material that arrives at the end of a sentence. And so they refer to that location as a stress position. If the writer is aware of this tendency, she can arrange for the emphatic information to appear the moment the reader is naturally exerting the greatest emphasis. And as a result, the chances greatly increase that reader and writer will perceive the same material as being worthy of primary emphasis. So the very structure of the sentence helps persuade the reader of the relative values of the sentence's contents. The other end of the sentence we have the topic position. So this establishes for the reader a perspective for viewing the sentence as a unit. Readers expect a unit of discourse to be a story about whoever shows up first. It also ha this, the topic position also has an important role in terms of uh, linking back to previous material. So it should usually contain some old or familiar information to establish context. And then from topic to stress positions, again, these authors write, the inclination to direct more energy to that which arrives last in a sentence seems to correspond to the way we work at tasks through time. We tend to take something like a mental breath as we begin to read each sentence, summoning the energy we use to pay attention to the unfolding of the syntax. As you recognize that the sentence is drawing towards its conclusion, you begin to exhale that mental breath, producing a sense of emphasis. However, what comes between these two positions could, in some sense, be interpreted as an interruption. So the reader's expectation stems from a need for resolution of the syntax, fulfilled only by the arrival of the verb, which either here strongly suggests or is responsible for. So without the verb, we don't know what the subject's doing or what the sentence is all about. And as a result, the reader focuses attention on the arrival of the verb and resists recognizing anything in the interrupting material as being of primary importance. The longer the interruption lasts, the more likely it becomes that the interruptive material actually contains important information, but its location will continue to indicate that it's merely an interruption. So it's very useful then to learn from what we might term the traditional approach to scientific writing, and the cunning defensive writer then knows where they can best conceal their valuable information. So that is, a defensive writer is not naive. They protect themselves and they don't hand the opposition gifts to, with which to be punished over and over. There are many other ways to do this. So the passive voice, for instance, is always to be preferred over the active. It gives the impression that your work has been sanctioned by a higher authority, 
or at least some of your peers. So for instance, saying something like this is not a great idea because it's clear and it's direct. And if it comes from the likes of, of me, well, who's going to, to believe that one? <laughs> Phrased in this manner, slightly better. It looks like at least one other person believes this, and it may slow the referee down a fraction. So if you work with mathematics, with equations, you can con consider numbering only those you refer to, leaving the others unnumbered. <laughs> That way, it's more difficult for the referee to specify what's wrong with those that come between. Frequent use of words like obvious let the reader know that you're not to be trifled with. You could consider also replacing nothing at all with your favourite double negative. And if you're a theorist, the phrase highly non-trivial should appear at least once in your document. So to summarise, Every reader of your work is potentially hostile, be they referee, external examiner, or colleague looking to crush or possibly generalize your work. Protect your science, make the reader work, give nothing for free. The defensive writer knows that you had to work hard to understand the science, and so too should the reader. And always remember, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Uh, thank you, and I'll do my best to uh, evade your questions. <laughs>